Welcome to the UNLV Sociology Department video discussions, and this is the second part of our interview with Professor Gail Hawkes, who has come to us all the way from Australia. She's a professor of sociology at the University of New England, and she has written a number of books on sex and sexuality from a sociological perspective, including Sociology of Sex and Sexuality, uh, Sex and Pleasure in Western Culture, and Theorizing the Sexual Child with Professor Danielle Egan. Um, so one of the things we were talking about last time was that sex is not natural and that your work in particular looks at history to show how these ideas have changed over time. And we talked a little bit about uh, ancient Greek culture, Athenian culture in particular. Mm -hmm. So that was a long time ago. What's different now? Has it really changed? And, and what has and hasn't changed in that mm -hmm. time? Another short answer question. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, well, I, th I think the most obvious one, for at least if we're looking into the past, into the distant past, is that we now categorize um, sexuality uh, in terms of the body and its uses. Uh, whereas, if we talk, talk the body? about the body, I mean, yeah. isn't the body naturally that's what we're talking about with yeah. sex? Or yeah, is well, that just my own? Well, no, that's mm. fair enough. I mean, no, exactly. In some levels, um, sex is about the body, and thank heaven it is. Otherwise, it'd be pretty boring having <laughs> sex. Um, but, but the um, what I was more talking about, um, as we were talking earlier in our previous chat, was, was the ideas about sex um, and what, what is uh, and how these ideas um, decide or at least uh, promote what is good sex and what is bad sex, what is legal and what is illegal and so on. Um, and when I said that it was categorised according to the body, this was more about um, uh, what, what you did with your sexual body um, the sort of categories that we're familiar with now um, that people hopefully are still challenging. But for example, that um, th there, is only, there are only two directions that your desires can take. Uh, one is to your own sex um, and the other is to the opposite sex. And so um, heterosexuality, desires towards the opposite sex, has been uh, what well, has been developed over time as being the, uh, if you like, the pinnacle of of the ordering of sex. In other words, the one, the form of sexuality is seen most close to nature and the most acceptable. Um, on the other hand, homosexuality uh, has, and we're all aware of this at least in the Anglophone West, has been um, only relatively recently decriminalised. Uh, it was criminalised probably from the end of the 18th century, though not by, um, uh, st previous to that by, um, so by decree rather than by statute law. But it's, it really has been the subject of legal uh, proscription since around about the middle of the 16th century and before that, of course, by the church. So we've had this pr procession of categorizations of sexual desire that, is, that has happened um, really, as my book suggests, throughout sort of the history of Western culture. But in terms of today, we've ended up with a very much more complex um, categorization. It's not that straightforward anymore. Um, yeah, we've just we've just legalized marriage, gay marriage, in a number of of setting of states in the mm. U.S. Um, but I'm I'm curious uh, if what what essentially is the difference between this notion of homosexuality today and what what still reproduces? For example, mm. I think one of the things that's most interesting about Greek culture compared to today is that there weren't the same kind of categories of male female there were mm. but uh, the things that we associate with gender today like uh, uh, women are supposed to be not sexual and uh, men are supposed to be active partner and mm. women are passive um, that has certainly changed today even though it's different but uh, I mean, it's different. It is, and it isn't. That's um, exactly right. I think when I said it was more complex, yeah. now um, I think uh, then what we're what you're just saying is true. I mean, I think that 
if we look at the, the points at which the uh, homosexuality as a category emerged, which was the end of the 19th century, uh, that was part of a project to actually sort of, if, if you like, the project of modernity, where almost every dimension of social life was being categorized in one form or another. Yeah. So this was I the emergence of... I think that's a really important yeah. point, that modernity really yes. categorized all sorts of behaviors. But Absolutely. No, true. no, I think I agree with you entirely. And I think that while this ancient history is fascinating, what it does is to direct us uh, into asking questions of the present. But if we're talking about modernity, it's although we generally date that from around about the middle of the 17th century, this slow progression um, into, but most specifically the 18th and the 19th century, and especially the 19th, um, we're, we're looking at a process that, that is an escalating one of uh, rationality, of categorization of all aspects of human life, um, of uh, considerations of means to ends in our social actions and also in our, in our sort of moral uh, the expectations of our moral behaviour. And all of these things sort of impacted on the construction of sex in modernity. So that we see, um, we see, as I said, the categories. So there are now no longer sort of more relevant, there were fixed categories about what was acceptable desire and what wasn't. Um, but that, that category was established not, not in terms of people's morals or social standing, it was, it was established in terms of the function and the outcome of sex. And so that was, if you like, the rationalisation of sex and desire, where the desire that the Greeks had for these beautiful boys before they grew beards uh, was considered to be utterly irrational, there was a, in, at least in modern terms. It wasn't, of course, irrational for the, for the, in those times. It was absolutely uh, a rational direction of desire. But um, in modern times, the, it wasn't, the focus was more on the uses of the body and the outcomes of those uses. So then what's the, explain a little bit more, what do you mean by mm -hmm. the uses of the body in modernity? Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's really the uses of the body, I suppose, specifically, uh, the, direction, the, the uses of the body parts. So, for example, we think about what people do sexually uh, in terms of, you know, how they have sex, basically. Uh, the focus of, in, in the 19th century, the classic example of this, I think, is masturbation. Um, from the end of the 18th century, but escalating to almost hysterical, hysteria by the end of the 19th century, was a concern about what happens if people masturbated. Um, and it was called onanism for a lot of this time, which was associated with biblical practices and story, uh, not, uh, sort of Old Testament stories and so on. But the focus here wasn't on the religious prescription of masturbation, because in fact early Christianity didn't really care much about it, they acknowledged it but didn't care much. The focus here was on the misuse of the body. What? So. Oh. So that's where they, if you masturbate you're going to go blind, yeah. or if you masturbate this is going to happen. You're going insane, blind. Um, and it was the same actually for men and women, surprisingly, because often we focus on, perhaps even now, um, focus more on male masturbation than on female, um, at least in, um, but then uh, it was not just male and female, but also children, male and female children, who were considered in this hysteria about masturbation, to be doing themselves extreme physical harm. So in the end they, as you said, go insane, or, and often did end up in lunatic asylums, right. especially the women. Huh. So does that? So well, we talk a lot about modernity, but now uh, mm -hmm. we're in a period of post-modernity mm -hmm. after some dated after World War II, some dated after 1980s. However, so is this concern with the uses of the body dramatically different now than it was in modernity, or, or is it the same? You have you have a knack for asking really good questions <laughs> that will take ages to answer. No, but a perfect, absolutely important question because. I guess the answer once again for the third time is yes and no. Yes is about uses of the body, um, but now we've sort of introduced pleasure into the mix, as you said, from about the mm, beginning of the third decade maybe or of, of the 20th century, but it's escalating in the second half of the 20th century, the importance of sexual pleasure, recognised as important for health, mental and physical health, important especially for happy marriages, um, but also also, although all of that was, was very positive, there were sort of fears which remain sort of swirling around the idea of sexual pleasure. And those fears were often expressed in terms of young people, um, in terms of homosexual and the practices, less so um, lesbian practices. 
curiously, of course, there's been... didn't care about women Nobody particularly that, cared, and still, actually, I mean, in terms of the law, really don't care. That's because homosexuality was so important, not just for m monitoring sexuality, but for monitoring gender, to make sure yeah, men exactly. were directed in a certain way, and they didn't care what women... They did, but not... At this it wasn't level. a threat to to the dominant form or gendered um, status, which of course was masculinity. So that. recreational sex, mm, I would mm -hmm, say, is mm. something is much more acceptable in postmodern times. Not that Oops. it wasn't, not that pleasure wasn't, but pleasure is valued, and there's a whole industries of making yes. sure that we have sexual pleasure in, in the right ways. Um, yes. But what about for children? Is that changed, or is that the same? Now that that is really, I mean, it's what Danielle and Egan and I talked. We we did the history of ideas about the sexual child in that book because, just as we said earlier on, if you want to understand the present, it's, it's it really isn't, especially about sex. It's very instructive to go back to the past, and so that's what we did in theorizing the sexual child. Um, and we're also at the same time written about the fears about sexualization of girls. So um, um, the so it was those two things running together, the history of it and these, these, the, the contemporary thing, uh, contemporary discussions about the, ch the childhood sexuality or sex and the child, um, pointed up just how little had changed. Indeed, I think it's retrograde. I think it's gone backwards. Oh. Huh. You know, this attitude to sex, children's sexuality. It's very, very difficult now to talk about the sexual child without somehow being aligned with... Or, or, or a supporter of pedophilia. Ah, so while some things have changed dramatically, many things have, a few things have changed pretty much the same. And I think what's important about your and Danielle's book on theorizing the sexual child that, that very few people have looked at that historically. So everybody needs to take a look. <laughs> I want to thank <laughs> Professor Hawks for being with us today. Thanks, um, And uh, we'll see you all next time. Yes, bye.